Amen. Good morning, everybody. Goodness, it is good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Man, I am just so, so excited, and I hope you are too. And I tell you, God's God's on the move. Amen. Amen. He is on the move, and I and I pray that you that you sense that in your heart and in your mind. You can turn with me to Joshua chapter six, uh, the Old Testament book of Joshua. We're we'll looking at chapter six. While you're turning there, uh, a couple of uh, just noteworthy things. One is, um, I can't believe I'm saying this, but we are starting practices for Christmas choir. Christmas. I think Christmas is like 11 Fridays away or something. It's like really, there's like not much time left. Um, <clears throat> so now that you're all sad, um, but we're going to be starting our practices on the 14th. Um, if you want to be part of the Christmas choir, um, then you can sign up in the, as, you're, as you're leaving uh, the sanctuary. There's a little round table right before the stairwell to go into the front lobby. And um, I, would, I would love for you to be a part of the Christmas choir. We always uh, have a, just a wonderful time. It's led by Tina Lampert. It's a great, great experience. And uh, I've, I've sung in the Christmas choir uh, for a few years, and I'm sorry for that, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but did do it. And so uh, I pray that, uh, pray that you will really take that in consideration. And it's a tremendous ministry. You'd be surprised at just how, what an impact it can have. So, uh, so please join me with, in that. Um, also, uh, just, just to God's glory, I wanted to note that today marks the six-year anniversary of uh, Jeanette and I's installation as the senior pastors here um, at the church. Amen. Amen. So thank you for keeping us on board, um, despite the singing and everything else. And uh, so, but, but God's good. And so, and here's, here's the praise report is that, is that God has, is doing a beautiful thing here and uh, just continuing to grow his church. Amen. And, uh, and he is, he is doing a, a wonderful, wonderful thing. So uh, if you've been with us for these past several weeks, you know that we have been journeying with the people of Israel, um, that they have been on this track, and we've seen them uh, come out of Egypt up to, the, um, up to the promised land, that they were denied their inheritance because, um, because of a falsified fear. And can I tell you, that's what the enemy does. He, he, he speaks false things into our heart and into our spirit. And if we will believe them, then he will rob you of the promise that God has for you. That's been the underlining thesis in some of this, this teaching. And so if you remember, the people of Israel came back and they said, we saw giants in the land and we are as grasshoppers to them. The giants never called them a grasshopper. The giants never even threatened them. But they came back and said, we cannot obey God because of the because they must see us as grasshoppers and so and so the enemy began to feed their spirit with fear and so that whole generation wanders the desert for 40 years they have died off moses their leader has also died joshua is now in charge of the israelites roughly two million people and now he is leading them uh, into their promise and so they're stepping into their new authority um, they're stepping across the jordan river going into the land flowing with milk and honey which is everything that god promised that it would be and um, and now they are now they are experiencing the promises of God, and they they've been hearing about this for for a very long time since they were born. This whole generation since they were born, they've heard about this land, but now they are walking in the fulfillment of that promise, and um, and so they're faced with their very first wave of adversity. Uh, we get into jo Joshua around chapter five. We start seeing that that uh, when we talked about this last week about <clears throat> about um, they were going into Jericho, and Jericho was a walled city, a fortified city. And again, just like before, the devil tries to, to give them falsified fears, tries to tell them, listen, you cannot defeat Jericho. Their walls are too big. You cannot walk in your promise because the walls are are too large. How can you penetrate such fortified, such a fortified city? And even if you get through the walls, then you have an army to contend with. You will never do it. 
Anybody had anybody in your life tell you that you can't or that you never could? Can I tell you that's what the enemy wants to do in your life? He wants to spew lies and falsities into your high, into your mind to get you to believe that you can't, that you don't have the ability, that you're not strong enough, that you're not called, that you're not talented enough, that you're not resourced enough, that there's no way that that promise that God's put in your heart, you can't attain it because the walls are just too big. And if you remember, it was 40 years prior when the people of Israel were, uh, when the spies went in and they saw those giants. If you remember, that was all in the book of Numbers. And, and we read and we discovered in Numbers chapter 22 that the Bible tells us that, that the giants were not threatening the Israelites. But the Bible says that the giants were actually afraid of Israel. They were afraid of them. The Bible says they were afraid of them because they were many. And now, now here we are 40 years later, and they're coming up, up against Jericho. And in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, I want you to see the common theme here. The devil tries to, to fortify lies. The devil tries to falsify our, our future. And, and, but, but here's the truth, and God's unveiling the truth. And the truth is found in Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, where it says, Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut. Why? Because the people were afraid of the Israelites. Can I tell you that the enemy of God is always afraid of the people of God? Amen? But, but the enemy will try his very best to intimidate us, to lie to us. To, can I just tell you, the devil is not your friend. It is, it is not honorable, uh, it, is, it, is, it is not honorable to try to work out a deal with the devil, to just try to get along. The enemy is, has also has a plan for your life, to kill you, to destroy you, to absolutely annihilate you. Kill, steal, and destroy, the Bible says. Roaming around, seeking whom he may devour, like a roaring lion, the Bible tells us. The devil is not your friend. The devil wants to stop you because the devil knows what you're capable of if you craft your mind around the promises that God has spoken over you. Amen. So we discussed last week that Joshua has been given a new strategy to defeat the enemy. It's not a conventional strategy. It actually makes no sense at all by human standards. Because we learned that last week that God's plans are the best plans. Amen. Amen. But, but we, and, and so, so God sends out the worship team. He says, I want to send the worship team out. And I, and I want you to lead the army on their way to defeat Jericho. And I want you to march around. I don't want you to say anything. See, sometimes we say, you know what, Lord? I would go talk to that person, but I don't know what to say. <laughs> Father, I, I, would, I would go start that ministry, but I don't know what to do. I, 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 would, I would stand in the gap for you, God, but I don't know what, what I'm supposed to even talk about. And God says to the people of Jericho, I don't want you to say anything. I want you to get the ark, which represents my covenant to you, and I want you to march around the city one, once, one time this whole day. And I want you to do that every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, I want you to march around the city seven times. Then I want you to blow your trumpets. And then I want you to shout. And then the walls are going to fall down. Amen. Now, we amen that. But if you are one of the, the, the Israelites, you're like, good job, God. Great plan. <laughs> this, this makes no sense. We're going to march around. These guys have got spears, bows and arrows, flaming arrows, swords. They're trained warriors, Jericho. They're standing on their wall from an elevated position. They could take us out at any time. And you want us to just go, ah! <laughs> Great plan. But I will tell you that they were obedient to this strategy. And every single thing that was uttered from the mouth of God came to pass because they were obedient to what God told them to do. Amen? And so, and so in, in, in this key verse for today, we learn something as we read, uh, as we round out this series on Minecraft. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 27 
says this. So the Lord was with Joshua and his reputation spread throughout the land. We're going to dig into that deeper here in just a minute. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. Father, for the power of your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that right now, this day, God, that there is going to be new life that is going to be ignited in men and women in this church. Father, right now, today, Father, you, you are raising up students, Lord, that have such a holy boldness, and Lord, that are so driven and, are, and, are, and believe your word with such a reckless abandon. Father, that there is absolutely, truly, as your word says, no weapon formed against them that will prosper, but they will, that they will rise up to be mighty warriors for you. Father, I thank you, Jesus, that today strongholds are being broken even now as the word of God is being uh, perceived. Lord, I thank you, Lord, today, Father God, that there's healing in this house, that there's deliverance in this house, that there's joy in this house. Father, I thank you for the peace of God that surpasses our ability to even understand it. I thank you, Jesus, that right now, Lord, we're operating on a supernatural plane. And Father, that you even now are planting in the hearts of men and women God-sized strategies that may not make sense in human terms, but Father, that you are assembling us and activating us, Father, uh, to, to do great and mighty things for the kingdom of God. And we give you the praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, I want to I wanna end this series the way I started this series. It was with this statement. Do not let the enemy lie to you and therefore limit you. Do not let the enemy lie to you and therefore limit you. Realize that the enemy, like just like the, against the giants and just like the people of Jericho, your enemy is actually afraid of you. Come on, church, you need to get this into your spirit because you need to understand that the, the enemy of your soul fights you tooth and nail because he understands the power of the spirit of God that is in you. He is a defeated foe. He has already been conquered. He is already under the foot of our Savior, Jesus. Amen? And because of that, because you carry within you the Spirit of God, which is greater than the Spirit of Him that is in this world, you have authority and power over Him as Jesus, uh, as, as, as a co heir with Jesus, as sons and daughters of the Most High God. You have an authority, and He is fearful of that authority. You have a new identity in Jesus. You have a new authority in Jesus, which is imparting new strategies inside of your life. And as we read today in Joshua chapter 6 and verse 27, that Joshua's reputation spread throughout the land. What that means is not only does he have an identity and authority and a strategy, but now he's gaining new territory. He's gaining new territory. How many of you ready to take back something that the enemy stole from you? See, too many, too many people are living limited because the enemy stole your freedom from you. And in church, who, who here is ready to take new ground and new territory and go to new levels and reach higher heights and go further than you've ever dreamed that you ever could before? I, that's where I want to go. I don't want to stay stuck. I, I want a new life, man. I've seen God do some really, really amazing things in my life. But I'm only scratching the surface of how great my God is. I'm telling you as sure as I'm standing in front of you this morning that, this is a, that, that God has taken us to a new place. That God wants to take your, uh, take your reputation. And he wants to spread it and spread it and spread it throughout new lands. New territories. New places that the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you and direct you in. Your mind should be crafted on new, new territory, on new territory, new territory. Listen, don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck. God, God's planted a dream inside of your heart. You know what it is. Some of, us, some of us haven't revisited it for so long because life got in the way. Life did not get in the way, church. The enemy got into your head. Amen. He has robbed you of the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, territory can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Most of the time when we think of territory, we think of property or land, physical territory. 
Can I tell you, as a church, we need some physical territory. Amen? We need some new land. And God, I'll, I'll tell you, I grapple with this every week. And every, every conversation that comes up when people, they, they see me in town. I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking colleagues and, and people in the town and, and, and many people here in the church. And they get around me and they're like, so what's up with the land? That's the question. I'm like, God's up to something. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm ready, man. Let's go. But, but God's timing is perfect, and so we need that physical space, and God is going to give us that physical territory. But for some people, can I tell you, that territory is a mental territory. It's, a, it's an intellectual territory. The enemy is taking up real estate in your thinking. He's, he's in your head. He's lied to you and, and deceived you and manipulated you and convinced you of something that is less than what God has already died on the cross for you for new territory in your mind. For some people, territory is an emotional space. Some of you here, the Holy Spirit wants to free you from past hurts and pains so that you can learn to love again, so that you can forgive, so that you can trust. Listen, I, I, know, I know that betrayal hurts. It cuts deep. I've been betrayed before. I know what that feels like. And only through the power of the Holy Spirit released in your life and trusting that God is going before you will you ever be able to live in the fullness of that emotional territory that he has for you. But you can't overcome. You can't overcome. For some of us, territory is a social space. And I'm not talking about Instagram. I'm not talking about Facebook. I, I'm talking about gaining favor with those people that are in your sphere of influence people that you interact with day in and day out, people maybe that they've already made some judgments about you, maybe people are talking about you, maybe people have said some false things about you and you've actually begun to believe what they have said. Or maybe you have begun to believe what you have perceived what they have said. Maybe you think that you are like a grasshopper to them, like the people of Israel felt against, about the giants in the land. It's all a fear tactic. It's a falsified fear. And, and maybe your social space needs to be, maybe you need to take some territory in that area and see new spheres open up in your life. Can I tell you, just because, don't limit yourself, church. You have no idea the influence that you will be able to have when you walk in the authority of yours as a king's kid. Amen. There are people that you will, that God will open. Listen, the Bible says that God can open up doors that no man can open. And he can shut doors and no man can shut. So don't you dare say that I could never or I should never. If God's called you to it, you trust him to, to take you there every single day. And you say, well, I'm not, I'm not like them. No, you're not. You're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You, are, you belong to Jesus. Amen. God, God wants to enlarge. Boy, I, I, I came to preach today. I hope you're being blessed. Listen, God... God wants to enlarge your territory, church. He wants to grant you your own promised land, but the devil will fight you every step of the way. God has purposed that you would grow and that you would expand and that you would explore and that you would operate with the authority in a larger influence. Imagine what that looks like if every soul here operates in the fullness of the potential that God has placed inside of your heart. I am telling you, think of what Jesus did with 12 ragtag disciples and turned the world upside down. Amen? Amen? Just imagine if the church of Jesus Christ would lock into this and realize the authority that we have in the spiritual world. We got to live our lives so focused on Jesus that every time we get close to the enemy territory, every time we start getting closer and closer, that we realize that the enemy is actually afraid of us. Amen? That like those giants in the land, the armies were afraid of the people of Israel and the people in Jericho were afraid of Israel because the reason why they're afraid the reason why the, the enemy is truly afraid is because he's already defeated. The reason that he's afraid is because we have come ready to fight. The Bible talks about the armor of God. 
We've, we, have, we have referenced it a couple of times throughout this series. When you show up into, into a new territory and you're fully equipped with the full armor of God found in Ephesians 6, then I will tell you something. You've got the enemy running already. Because God has given you everything that you need to overcome any adversity that you'll ever have. That's why the Bible says that, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And that's why the Bible says that no weapon formed up against you will prosper. Amen. Because you're, all, you're carrying a bigger stick, church. <laughs> so, so one of the, those pieces of equipment that we've talked about and really want to focus on here for about an hour and a half is the... <laughs> hey, listen... I'm here, till, I'm here till 7 o'clock tonight, so let's go. <laughs> yeah, you say that till lunchtime. Yeah. Come on, pastor. Come on, preach. Whew. Anyway, helmet of salvation. The helmet. I want to talk to you about the helmet for just a minute because I've alluded to this a couple of times, but have you thought about how essential this piece of equipment is for your survival, for your spiritual survival? Head injuries are among the worst injuries that you, that you can incur. If, you, if you've ever had a head injury, you know one thing about a head injury is they bleed like no other place in your body, right? You get, I mean, I was at Pow Wow this weekend with the Royal Rangers, and uh, there's about 40 of us, 40, between the men and the boys, there was 40 of us there. At, at, they're still there at Hot Brook. I couldn't take any more. I had to come home. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I had to come preach, man. Come on. And... Um, and so about every, about, and, and listen, about every 10 minutes, you know, so another kid would come, come over and, oh, I'm bleeding, you know, and, and their face is full of blood. And, and then, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> All the moms are like, oh, get on the phone, texting their husbands. But, when you, but if you've had a kid who's had a head injury, you know that they're, uh, suddenly their whole face is just full of blood. But then when you begin to wipe it all off, it's this tiny little abrasion, Right? It, it looks, I remember when we were in the, in, the, um, in the renovation at our house, I actually preached a whole sermon called Blunt Force Trauma because I got, I got hit in the head and, uh, and it wasn't that bad of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a blow, but man, did it bleed. And I felt so cool, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but head, head injuries, head injuries bleed. They just bleed and bleed. But, but you know that not only, not only do head injuries physically have a dramatic response, but head injuries also emotionally and mentally can damage you for a very long time. When you, when you have, when you have been, when you've been attacked in your brain, when you've been attacked, then, then things like post-traumatic stress can incur. It's a very real condition. People being uh, paralyzed and immobilized because of something that had happened in their past. Um, stress and, and high, high measures of, of, uh, of impact in your life, emotional and, and mental impact can have physical ramifications in your body. Uh, doctors will tell you that there's autoimmune problems that are activated because of things that have happened traumatically in your thinking. If you've ever struggled with depression uh, or anxiety or high levels of stress, you know you know that, that those, things, uh, those things can cause you to be paralyzed, that, that your thoughts can prevent you from being able to eat or from being able to get out of bed or even leaving your house, that it, that it can absolutely immobilize you. You see, the devil knows this, and so does God. And that's why God, when he said, listen, I'm, I'm going to do my very best and send my very best by sending my son to die for you and forgive you of your sins so that you and I can be in fellowship together. I want you to be, I want that reality to be so protected that that salvation is going to come in the form of a helmet that is protecting your mind. And when you think about, when you think about weapon or, or helmets of warfare such as this one, you realize that, that, the, that the helmet protects your ears. It, it comes down over your ears and it protects the back of your neck so that, so that uh, uh, sneak attacks from behind will have, will have little to no significance upon you because you're protected. That, that your ears are guarded because, can, let me tell you, um, we got to be careful of what we, what we allow ourselves to listen to. I'm talking, I mean, about, about gossip, 
about, about music, about things that get into our, into our subconscious because of what we are allowing into our ears. And so God says, I want you to guard the realities of your salvation with a helmet that protects your ears. My, my wife and I were at a diner with my daughter, Shaylin, uh, not too long ago. And I came, when I shared this in first service, I came to the realization that most of my uh, illustrations start with, I was at a diner in town. <laughs> and uh, made me laugh. Uh, but anyway, we were at this diner and we were just, we were just talking and, and having a, a nice time, the three of us. And, and this lady came up and she, uh, she just kind of introduced herself and just started in, in invading our personal space. And, and so she just... Was, having her thing whatever and she's sharing that it was her birthday and we're like happy birthday and and all this and so we're having this and um and so she she took a, a good part of our personal family time but but that was okay i was hoping that it would be an opportunity to share jesus with her and and so but she wouldn't give me a an, even a second i mean she was just talking and talking and talking <laughs> and um and then she says well listen i'm uh, before i go i want to i want to leave you with a joke and uh, and so we're like okay, and we got we got a, she got about halfway into her her joke and before the punchline and and it became crystal clear to me that this thing was going south very fast and that her joke was going to have a, a, a dirty punchline and and so uh, you know my job is as as the leader of my home is I've got my daughter right there I mean I'm, I'm the protector of my daughter and the protector of my wife and so and so I this thing wells up with inside of me but I've also got a mama bear sitting across the table from me and so so the two of us like in unison like a like a like in tandem we we just said enough I don't want to hear your joke and she says oh but it's really funny I said honey it probably is very funny but but uh, if you'll excuse us, we'd like to just have our time with our family now. And, and I will tell you what that is, is that's protecting your, your ears and protecting your, your, your heart and your spirit. Because like, can I tell you, she came in the form of a nice elderly lady, but can I tell you she was being influenced by, by a very dark spirit. And that is true, and that's just a silly example, but it happens all the time around us. The enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. He will use anything he can to get you and to influence you. Have you noticed that a helmet of salvation, a helmet of warfare, has very limited eye uh, ability, uh, visual, uh, th that, that the purpose of you is to be able to see. But have you noticed, I have never seen, I have never seen a, a helmet of warfare that has a rearview mirror on it. Because you are never, when you are, listen, whether you play football or whether you're on, whether you're on the front lines of a, of a, of a, of a war, you're, you are never supposed to be looking at what's behind you. Your assignment is to move forward. Amen? You are designed and your, your whole purpose, your calling is to take steps forward. In fact, you even have very little periphery uh, visibility because, because the, that's the job of the people that are on your flank to be protecting your side and for, to be protecting what's behind you. Your job is to stay focused on the goal. Amen. It's a helmet of salvation. It's designed to keep you focused. It's designed to block out all the noise from the enemy so that you can stay the course. Remember who you are. Your helmet is the crown of your armor. It protects the truth that you are saved, the truth that you are set free from sin, the truth that you are no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer subject to the enemy. The helmet of salvation is a war cry of your freedom in Christ. And that's why it's called the helmet of salvation. It should always be at the forefront of your mind that you have a new identity in Jesus. Because the enemy will try to steal that. Because he knows if he can steal your identity, he knows that he will steal your new authority. And if you're not walking in your authority, you'll never be willing to listen to the strategies. Can I tell you that the people of Israel would never have walked around Jericho if they weren't walking in the authority of God? They would have never paid attention to that strategy if they didn't feel like they had the authority that they were walking in of God. And as you listen to those uh, strategies, it will move you into new territory. Church, it's time for us to go get our promise. God has a promise. He has promised you and promised you and promised you and promised you. He has so much in store for you. But we've got to be willing to go get it. Because your life, your life is built on a series of thoughts. Do you realize that? 
Because what you do, you say, well, no, it's built on what I do. But what you do comes from what you think. Your life is built on a series of thoughts in the same way a house is built on a series of bricks. You start taking random bricks out of your house, guess what? It's going to compromise the structure of your dwelling. You start taking, you start taking, your, um, you start taking the building blocks of thoughts out and you start compromising those, guess what? It's going to compromise the integrity of your calling. The reason why is because there's a direct relationship between the quality of your thinking and the quality of your life. There's a direct relationship. There's a direct correlation between the quality of your thoughts and the quality of your life. That's why I told you before, if you've ever struggled with fear and anxiety and depression, that you know that staying at home and not talking to people and reclusing yourself and, and, just, and just being submerged into your, own, uh, into your own situation becomes very real to you. But can I tell you, church, that in the same way that fear and anxiety and depression are very real things, that also is a joy unspeakable that's full of his glory. Amen. That, that it is very true that there is, in fact, a peace that surpasses all your understanding. It's very true that there is an eternal hope that is secure inside of your heart. It's true that there is a blessing that is new every morning and his faithfulness is available to you. It's true that there's a blessed assurance that Jesus is yours and that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. There is a grace that is sufficient for you and you can live an overcoming life. It's very true. Because the quality of your thoughts affects the quality of your life. That's why scripture tells us in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 to set your mind on things above and not on things below. Set your mind. You make up your mind. I am following Jesus, period. And devil, you have no room inside of my heart, in my life, in my mind, in my family, in my finances, in my coming, in my going. You are defeated. I am over you because of Jesus Christ who lives in me. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence for from it flows the springs of life. 1 Peter 1, 13 says, Therefore, prepare your mind for action. We cannot just come to church and just say, Well, okay, God, do your thing. We have, there is action involved in, on our part. We are to be activated into ministry, activated in our authority, activated in the strategies, activated in the taking on of territory. God's not going to just give you the territory. you got to go get it. He's just going to make sure that you have everything you need to accomplish everything he's called you to do. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, because your strategies are, will direct and shape who you are. Your, your, your mindset will tell you where you're going to go and what you're going to own and where you're going to live and where you're going to work and, and who you're going to fall in love with and what you will ultimately accomplish in your life. It's all rooted in your thinking. So if you're not happy and you want a life change, I challenge you, why don't you try thinking for a change? Not just, not just listening to every whim. Listen, I mean, we can, we can go crazy with this Judge Kavanaugh stuff and the things goes on in the news and you can, you can just bang your head, oh, the world's gone to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, maybe so. But you know what? I ain't in that handbasket. I'm in the hands of my Savior. Amen? Amen. Think for a change. Don't try to convince, listen, don't try to convince somebody else by blaming that, of, of your situation by blaming it on your lack. You follow me? Don't, don't, try, to, don't, try, to, don't try to justify your, your situation with somebody else based on your lack. Don't, don't waste time making excuses as to why you're stuck where you're stuck. If I'd only, if I had never, I should have. Those are, those, are the, those are the trigger sentences of the enemy. 
all, this, all that says is because of my mistakes, I'm limited. But the Bible is clear that Jesus loved you while, listen, you were still a sinner. Amen. Died on the cross for you while you were still a sinner. While you're making your mistakes, knowing that you may never say yes to him, he still paid the ultimate price for you. So you cannot, you cannot justify your lack off of your mistakes, of your past. He says, I've got a future and a hope for you. Amen. But you got to follow my strategies. And I may ask you, I may ask you to march around the city and blow a trumpet. I may ask you to do something a little unconventional. I'm not looking for you to be perfect. I'm looking for you to be obedient. Amen. So that includes, you see, that the fact is that is that we got to change the way we think and make every thought, as, as 1 Corinthians says, every thought obedient to Christ. This includes all your bad thoughts, of course, but it also includes your honorable thoughts. Do you know that even your good and honorable thoughts need to be made subservient to Jesus Christ? Because you may have a really, really, really good idea, but it's not a God idea. we we got to be walking in God's plan. And so... so he, the, the, the Lord will begin to lay out for you new strategies for your life successes. I, I love Joel Osteen's, the, the title of Joel Osteen's book, that you can live your best life now. Whatever your feelings are on Joel Osteen, I think he's doing great work for the kingdom. But I, but I will tell you this, you can live your best life now. You don't have to be limited by, by anything else, by any of your past. Because, listen, it, if either, the, either, either the Bible is true or it's not. And if the Bible is telling me that greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world, then church, then I have an authority inside of me to overcome every adversity that presents itself in my journey. Amen? So you don't need more wealth or more resources or more connections or more networks or anything. You don't need anything else. All you need is to craft your mind around the facts. And the facts are, if you've given your life to Jesus, then you are a king's kid. And by being a king's kid, that comes with some perks and some privilege. I'm sorry, favor ain't fair, but I'm a child of the king. And so he and the, and the king is, is over it all. And so if he decides he wants to bless you, he's going to bless you. And it comes with privilege. And with that privilege comes authority. That's the facts. The facts are is that authority presents for itself strategies in your life that you would not have if you didn't have the authority that comes with being a king's kid. Oh, the devil doesn't want you to understand this stuff. He wants to blind you and, and cause you to take off your helmet of salvation and put it on the mantle as a trophy of something that happened to you at youth camp in 1996. But I will tell you that your testimony, you're only as, you're only as saved as your current testimony, church. Your testimony should be developing every single day. Every single day, God doing new things, new blessings. It's why he says his faithfulness is for every morning. Every morning, every morning is his blessing. Today's the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in that. Why? Because the Lord made it for me. Because he's got a blessing for me and he's got a purpose for me in my today. So I'm going to put on my helmet of salvation. And I'm going to go to battle once again. Every single day. And those strategies, if they're obeyed, they will enlarge your territory. They will enlarge your territory. About a decade ago, there was a book that swept the world called The Prayer of Jabez. Anybody remember this book, The Prayer of Jabez? Fabulous little read. And uh, The Prayer of Jabez was based out of the Jabez prayer, which is found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Here's, here's the actual prayer that Jabez prayed. It says, Jabez cried out to God of Israel, to the God of Israel. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And watch this. And God granted his request. No wonder this, this book made world acclaim because that is how we always want our prayer life to go. Lord, take away the pain. Give me everything that I'm asking you for. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here you go. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that'll preach. And it did all around the world. 
But I will tell you, many, many pastors preached this. Actually, they preached the book. They didn't preach the scriptures. That was one problem. But the other problem was they preached it completely out of context. Because the language here that Jabez prays for is he's not praying for wealth. And he's not praying for power. And he's not praying for even property. The territory that he's praying about is intellectual territory. He's praying about his mind. He's praying. His actual prayer is for God-sized strategies. And it's a humble prayer that he was asking God who would, that God would craft his mind around, his, around God's thinking so that he, Jabez, would have a greater capacity to believe that, what, that, that he could accomplish what God wanted to accomplish on his behalf and that he would not be limited by his own fearful thinking. That's the prayer. Can I tell you when, you, when you understand that, that makes the Jabez prayer very real, doesn't it? Because God gives us promises, but we limit ourselves by our own carnal thinking, and we think, well, we never can, and that's exactly where Jabez was. And he's saying, Lord, enlarge my intellectual territory so that I can have your strategies and focus on you and not listen to all the nonsense that the enemy's throwing at me. So he prayed that God would give him the ability to think big and to gain new territory. Church, nothing limits achievements like small thinking. Nothing limits achievements like small thinking. God is challenging us to, to look for God ideas, to live with strategies that have never been tapped into before, to be trailblazers in the faith, to craft our mind around the truth of God's word. So my question to you this morning is, what drives you spiritually? What's deep inside of you? Listen, when you get alone with God, I'm talking, I'm talking outside of praying for your spouse and your family and your finances and your job. Outside of that, when you really get alone with God, what gets you so driven that you know if you share that with other people, they're going to look at you with a blank face. They're going to be like, okay. You can, you know, God can do anything. <laughs> Have you ever done that? You, you, you had enough boldness to share a God vision that the Lord was speaking inside of your heart with somebody else. And when they heard it, they didn't have as much faith as you had. <laughs> and they're like, okay. And they look at you with that blank stare. But I want to tell you that God is, God, God wants us to be trailblazers in the faith. He wants us to, this is, this is why Jesus said, um, the things that you see me doing, even greater things than these will you do. Because he, he never intended for this to be the end all. He's saying, listen, I, the same spirit that's inside of me is I'm sending to you, the Holy Spirit. And when you're operating and moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, then guess what? The things that you've seen me do, well, you'll do those things, but even greater things than these will you do. That doesn't mean your equality with Jesus. It just means that you've been empowered by the same spirit that empowered him. Amen. Amen? And so, and guess what? I mean, it takes a lot of faith to take a, a few loaves of fish, a few loaves of bread and some fish and, 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 and pray to heaven and feed 5,000 people. That takes a, a great measure of faith to do that. But God said, even greater things than these will you do. And so he wants us to have greater faith, to do greater things for his kingdom. So that, so that, but but it, it takes understanding who you are. It takes understanding the authority that you have and listening to the strategies that the Holy Spirit gives you. And when you do, you gain new territory for the kingdom of God. Woo, man, I'm preaching myself happy. Come on, church. I think of, I think of trailblazers like John Pemberton who in 1886 took a regular uh, 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 medicinal syrup and added carbonated water to it, called it a refreshing drink, and we know it today as Coca-Cola. Who would have ever thought that it would have world impact the way that Coca-Cola does? I think of, of Michael Dell, who borrowed $1,000 from his family and friends and decided to, to, to launch a multi-billion dollar corporation out of his dorm room in college when he had the idea to go direct to consumer and, 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 take, and take care of their computer needs. Most of us at one point or another have had some kind of a Dell product in our households. You see, I, 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 and, he, and here's, here's the whole thing. This is a kingdom principle. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 tells us that where there is no vision, people will perish. 
It dies. When you don't have vision, everything falls apart. There's, there's no, the Bible says that in other versions, they, they will cast off restraint where there is no vision. It was Helen Keller who was completely and totally blind, who's famously quoted as saying, the greatest tragedy in life is people who have sight but no vision. Amen. I think of Walt Disney. <laughs> greatest place on earth. You guys all know my feeling on that. Um, he, who would have ever thought that this guy, Walt Disney, would draw a cartoon mouse and that would propel art and entertainment to levels of technology, engineering, imagination, and to the development of theme parks and movie experiences and businesses with worldwide recognition. But it took Walt Disney seeing past the obvious and believing to accomplish what had never been done before. And all he had in his hand was a pencil. Church, you have no idea the potential that's inside of your heart when it is paired up with the Holy Spirit strategies. There is nothing that can stop you, not even the devil, because the devil's afraid of you when you craft your mind around that. Your, your God-given strategies will complete your vision that connects you to your destiny and your future. So what God-given strategy has God placed in your heart that you've been too frightened to approach? I challenge you to walk in it because you were made for it. And may I suggest that whatever your predominant thought is in your life, that is what you're permitting to direct your life. Whether that thought is good or bad. I want to share with you, because clearly Mikey is coming to give you guys some hope that I'm bringing this in for a landing. Oh, foolish Mikey. <laughs> Can I tell you, this sermon series was started off as a one-week series. God has brought us in four weeks on this. I think the Holy Spirit's trying to get something into our hearts that you have an identity and an authority and he will give you strategies to take on new territories if we will craft our mind around Jesus. Amen? I want to share with you this quick little thought and then I'm going to scrap the other four pages of notes that I have. How's that? <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you because I talk about crafting your mind and I posed the question. I said, how do we do that? How do you craft your mind around Jesus? The, around the word and around God. And I, and I brought you to Philippians chapter four, verse eight. And I, and I put, I put a, a, a breakdown on the, on the screen. Yeah, it looked like this. Maybe if you were here, you remember this. And, we, and I preached this with such a passion and, I, and, I, and, and, and an authority. And in and, and one of our services, it even, it, we even rose in a standing ovation. And, it, and, and not, not because of me, but because of the power of this reality. That whatever's true and noble and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent or praiseworthy, the Bible says to think on those things. And so as with Pastor Grant later that afternoon, and we were talking, and I brought this up, and we were talking about how to how how if if the people of God would just truly focus on these things, then 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 what a, what an impact that would make. And he said, you know. He said, what if, it, what if it looked a little different? I said, what do you mean, Pastor Grant? He, and he, he kind of broke it down like this. He said, what if, what if we said, well, whatever's true, well, that's, that's Jesus. And whatever's noble, well, that's, that's Jesus. And whatever's right, well, that's, that's Jesus. And whatever's pure is, is Jesus. And whatever's lovely is Jesus. And whatever's admirable is Jesus. And whatever's excellent is Jesus. And whatever's praiseworthy, well, that's also Jesus. And so we're just supposed to think about Jesus. Let's think about Jesus. I'll close with this. Your focus will either feed your faith or confirm your fears. Where your mind goes, the focus of your mind will either feed your faith or it's going to confirm your fears. I challenge you to craft your mind around your identity. Listen to me, church. This is not, this is not just some cool alliteration. This is real Bible. You are 
bought by the blood of Jesus. If you have accepted that free gift of salvation, then you have a new identity in him. You, because of that, you have an authority over death, hell, and the grave, over the principalities and the powers and the rulers and dark places. That's why the enemy is afraid of you. But he will never admit that. He, instead, he will try to intimidate you with giants in the land or fortified cities or whatever the case may be in your personal life. And he will try to remind you that you can't, but you can. And not, and not only that, but God is going to give you the strategies that you need so that you can overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And when you do, you will take on new authority and you will take on new territory that God has already planned ahead of time. Remember that? Ahead of time for you. It's already written. He has already planned it. All you have to do is be obedient to it and tell the enemy, greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. Stand with me this morning, church. If you want to hear the whole sermon, come to fourth service. They're in real trouble. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just stand in your presence and in awe right now, God, of the power that you have. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for the love, that mighty love of Jesus. I pray, God, even now, Lord, that you just move on our hearts, Father, to be open and responsive to the guiding of your spirit. If you're here today, I will very quickly, we gotta move fast. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, and you want to start with a new identity. You've heard me preaching about taking territory and being free from your thoughts and being set and, and loose. And, and, and I want to tell you, it all starts with just simply saying yes, saying yes to Jesus. And if you're here and you need to give your life to Christ, I, I want to challenge you to submit your heart to him. Would you just say, I'm going to raise, by raising my hand today, I'm just saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Are you here today? Would you just raise your hand and say, when you pray, pastor, you're praying for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Is there anybody here that would want to say that prayer like so many others have? Thank you, sir. In the middle here, anybody else I need to give my thank you, sir, to my left. And two gentlemen here, third row and the front row over here. Anybody else I need to make, when I, by me raising my hand, I'm making my decision to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus today. All right, well, I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer with me and join these two as they, are, as they are preparing to have their new identity in Christ. Say, Dear Jesus, I stand before you today a sinner, but I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins. So today I receive that free gift of salvation I put on my helmet today because I belong to you. Thank you for forgiving me and setting me free. I'm going to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, I pray for this whole congregation as we prepare to leave this place. Let us leave under the authority that is ours in you, Father. Help us, God, to be overcomers. Help us, Lord, to just to, to not listen to the lies of the enemy, Father, but to craft our mind around our identity, our authority, our strategies, and the new territories that you have in store for us. We love you, Lord. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.